Well, thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate your time. Um, I think to start with uh, a big question, what is a universe? <laughs> if, if you were going to break it down to it, its fundamental principles, sort of a, um, what do you call it, a minimal viable product of a universe, what would that, what would that look like? What makes it up? Well, first, thanks for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure. So what is a universe? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think people use that term in different ways. There's the term multiverse that, uh, that's popular these days. Um, but I think the original meaning of universe is that it's everything that has ever existed and ever will exist. So in that sense, the multiverse is a bit of a misnomer because uh, if it's really there, it's part of the universe. Uh, but the way people use these terms now is they think of the multiverse as some kind of collection of separate parts of a bigger universe where maybe those parts can't communicate with each other at all, or, or maybe they can, but only in some weak way or only in the past, only in the future. So a, a simple example is just the fact that when we look out with telescopes in the universe, in the near, relatively nearby universe, there's a limit to how far we can see. And we can see only uh, back. So when we look out a long distance, we're also looking back in time since it took a long time for light to reach us. And so there's a kind of horizon we can't see further away than what would correspond to a certain distance back in time where the universe became opaque, not transparent to light. And so we see just this finite piece of the universe. And beyond that, we don't know much about what was there. So that's the observable universe. And what's beyond that might, you can think of it as a, as a sort of multiverse, or it might be just uh, more of the same, or it might be that the universe is finite and it ends if you could see further. Um, so yeah, so the observable universe is what we can see. The universe, I would say, is, is everything that there is and everything that there ever was. Right, again. So what would you call the patch? Obviously, this, this multiverse term is used that's perhaps a bit vague, as you were saying, but uh, what, would you, what would you call this little patch that we could see in reference to another patch? If we, call, we call what we can see the observable universe. Mm -hmm. But when, when someone refers to a, a different universe, if that means uh, anything, what, what are they referring to? Well, the, the idea that there could be observers elsewhere in this bigger space, let's call it a multiverse, there could be observers elsewhere in the multiverse, and they might be beyond <coughs> our cosmic horizon, in which case, at least for now, we can't see them and they can't see us. It's a bit like, you mentioned you live on an island. Um, if you were to climb to the highest point on that island, maybe you could see another landmass, but let's say all you could see is, is water, uh, then there could be another island that's beyond the horizon, and the same thing could be true there. So those uh, people on those islands have their they have what's within their horizon, which for them would be the observable universe. So there could be observers far from us, far enough from us that we can't directly contact them or see them because of the finite speed of light and the fact that the universe is uh, not infinitely old. There might be these parts of the universe that are just disconnected from each other, at least for now. Maybe in the far future, things will change. Okay. So uh, a, key, a key element of the uh, universe seems to be that we exist in what appears to be a three-dimensional space and we have the dimension of time. Yeah. Um, firstly, before we get too much into extra dimensions and stuff, what's the difference between a dimension of space and a dimension of time? How do we treat them differently and, and how, are they, how, how are they actually different? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. There's a lot of really deep mysteries connected to that that I think we still don't really have all the answers to. But, um, well, the, the simple answer to that is that mathematically, uh, even though space and time were, in a sense, unified by Einstein's theory of, of relativity, there's still a sharp distinction. Uh, distances in space you could think of as real numbers, and if you do so, then distances in time are imaginary numbers, like real numbers multiplied by the square root of minus one. Uh, now, that doesn't mean a whole lot, uh, just, to, just to hear it said, but what it means in equations is that, um, well, it means that, that distances in time are, are treated you know, in a fundamentally different way than distances in space. What Einstein showed is that observers who are moving relative to each other don't experience time passing at the same rate. So, uh, for example, an observer who, or someone on a, on a rocket ship that would fly at, at close to the speed of light, you know, away from the Earth and then back again, would find themselves younger <coughs> than their twin who remained on Earth. Or if you've seen the movie Interstellar, there's a, there's a scene, not to spoil it, but there's a scene where some of the characters go down to a moon that's orbiting very close to a black hole. So it's deep in a gravitational well. And another character remains behind further away. And uh, for a similar reason, people that are deep in gravitational wells, time passes more slowly. And so when they return, it's only been a few days for them, and it's been, I don't know, 20 years or something for the person that remained behind. So these are, these are real effects. But 
uh, it only goes so far. So, so these effects can speed up or slow down the relative flow of time, but they don't change the fact that time is still time and space is still space. And uh, so when we say there are three dimensions of space and one dimension of time, that's, that seems to be an intrinsic fundamental fact about, about the universe we live in. And we really don't know how to think about physics in other contexts. Like for example, mathematically you could have two times or more than, more than one time. Um, but, Could you go the other way? Could you conceive of a universe <coughs> with no time and just spatial dimension? Yeah, that's a little bit easier because that's more or less the universe at a fixed moment in time. Right. So that is not so difficult to, to study. I mean, I don't think you could imagine living or existing in a space like that right. because there's, that's really just an instant. Uh, but there's no problem analyzing equations or thinking about how physics would describe a system like that. Uh, in fact, we use that very often in theoretical physics. So when you when you speak about the the wider universe or the multi as some people would call it, is it is it possible that there are some bubbles in which there is no time or two time or or, or is there? Okay, yeah. I mean, it's I wouldn't say it's impossible, but I don't think anyone knows how to think about that in a in a useful way. I, I think the only way we understand uh, the only way I know how to think about the multiverse, at least, is in a framework where there is one time dimension right. and sort of a fixed number of space dimensions, but there's a little bit of a subtlety there that I can get into. So, uh, but, but always one time and some number of space dimensions. If there's a region where there's two times or zero times, yeah, that would be, I think it would have to be behind some sort of uh, event horizon or, or uh, disconnected from the rest of the universe in a, in a really fundamental way. Um, but, but the number of space dimensions can change, and that's much easier to understand. Right, and you mentioned there's a subtlety with that, so can we go into that? Well, what is the subtlety in terms of spatial dimensions in this universe? Right, so, so dimensions of space don't have to be uh, infinitely, they don't have to extend infinitely far. So normally when we think about a dimension, we, we think that if you were to travel in some direction, you just keep going forever and you just get further and further away from your starting point. But actually there's nothing wrong um, with, I mean, it's perfectly consistent to imagine that that's not the case. That instead, if you travel far enough in, in some direction, you might come back to where you started. And so a, a simple analog is just the surface of the earth. Obviously, if you travel far enough in a straight line on the surface of the earth, you'll actually return to where you began. Um, and so the surface of the earth has a, an interesting topology. It's not just a flat plane that goes on forever in two directions. It's a, a sphere. So it could be that some of the dimensions of space in the universe we live in are like that. They have a non-trivial topology. So they have the property that if you go far enough, you come back. So they're in some way curled up or, or return on themselves. And um, if the distance you would have to go is very, very far, let's say larger than the size of the observable universe, then it would be really difficult to detect that that's the case. People actually search for that in data. Uh, they look on the largest scales they can see, and, and, and if you see kind of the same pattern over here as you see over here in the opposite direction, it might be an indication that actually that dimension of space is curled in on itself. There's no observational evidence for that. But, it would um, be quite big news. It would be. Yeah. Um, but if that distance is you know, substantially longer than the size of the observ observable universe, you, you wouldn't see anything. So right. it's possible that even the three dimensions of space that we're used to are curled up like that. Um, but it's also possible that there are other dimensions of space which we're not aware of. And the reason we're not aware of them is that they fold back on themselves over an incredibly short distance. So if they curl up on themselves on a distance that's shorter than anything we can observe with any instrument we have access to. So we have microscopes that use you know, ordinary visible light, but you can't see anything that's smaller than a photon, than a, the wavelength of visible light um, with that because light is too crude of a, of a uh, to, to use for that. We have uh, scanning electron microscopes that can see smaller structures. We have particle accelerators that, that smash things together and get them very close indeed. But there's still a limit to how small of a scale we can probe with any instrument that we have access to. And if there were extra dimensions of space which were curled up on a scale even smaller than that, we wouldn't, we wouldn't know. We wouldn't have a way of, of detecting that. So in string theory, just to bring it up, there are extra dimensions. There are six extra dimensions of space, and, and they have to be curled up in this way. Um, so coming back to the multiverse, it, it's possible that as you move around in space, the size of those extra dimensions changes. And so it could be incredibly tiny here, and that's why we don't see them and why we think there are three dimensions. But if you go far enough away, maybe one of them has become large, and so there's four dimensions of space that are large, or even 10. 
In fact, it's not just possible, it's guaranteed. If string theory is correct, it must be the case that somewhere in the multiverse there are. What leads to that? Well, what causes the size of the, I mean, topologies to, uh, to change as you move throughout the, the wider universe? Yeah, that's a, another very good question. The physics that allows them to be compact like that is, um, well, there's a certain energy associated with different configurations of these extra dimensions. And uh, when you have energy that's a function of something, nature tends to find a minimum of the energy and settle into that minimum. Yes. So, uh, so that's, that's generally true. But the minimum that it finds might not be the absolute minimum. So for instance, this piece of chalk over here, it's sitting in this, um, this holder. It's in a local minimum of the energy, but that's definitely not the minimum because if I move it out, then it falls. Right, so now it's, it's decreased its energy even more and settled down into another minimum. Still not the global minimum. It could fall farther if we let it. So similarly, the dimensions, these extra dimensions of space, uh, they, are, um, they can be stable because they're in a local minimum, but that's not necessarily the global minimum. Uh, and so as you move around, you may find that the dimensions are in different local minima, and that would mean they have different shapes and sizes. All right, okay. Uh, and how, how do you model that? How do, how do you work out what the, what the minimal will be at certain points to, uh, to show that they will vary across across space. I, uh, that might be quite a mathematical question for this description, but is there a way to conceptualize that intuitively? It is a pretty technical right. topic, um, but we understand at least to some extent how to do that. Yeah. And uh, first we need a, a theory in which there are extra dimensions. String theory is the most famous. Um, but you can consider other theories that aren't string theories that have extra dimensions and have similar properties. Um, and then what you do is you study the possible topologies and geometries that those extra dimensions could, could take on. And the uh, set of such things depends on how many extra dimensions there are. If there's only one, the story is pretty simple. It, it can be, well, it could have two ends. It could be an interval, or it can be a circle that closes on itself, or it could just be infinitely large. That's about it. Um, if there are two extra dimensions, there's a, a famous branch of mathematics that back in the 19th century classified all the possible topologies. Those are called Riemann surfaces. Um, and more or less, they look like spheres, the surface of a donut, or bagel. This is New York, so a bagel. Um, two bagels stuck together, three bagels stuck together. So there's a, a pretty simple classification of those. As you go up in dimension, this gets more complicated. Um, but uh, still, mathematicians have worked on this for a long time, and they understand quite a bit about it. And then the physics of it is, given the topology, what are the shapes? So you could have a bagel that's smooth, or it could be bumpy, it could be sort of skinny in one way or not. So it, even once you know the topology, there's a lot of possible shapes that these geometries could have. And typically, some of those will correspond to these local minima of the energy that I was talking about. Um, but to figure out precisely which ones do and which ones don't, that takes a lot of analysis and of course a specific theory to, to start with. So you kind of mentioned it before and that we don't have any instruments that can detect these little curled up dimensions. I know string theory has got quite a lot of heat for, well, many have claimed that it's not falsifiable and it's had critique from there. In your view, is there is there a way in which we could go about, well, in which we could make testable predictions and and show at least likely or not whether it's true? Well, let's separate that into two separate questions. So one is, are there testable predictions? Yeah. And the other is, is it likely to be true? And I'd like to separate those two, because I think that the first one is a lot easier than the second. So the first one, a testable prediction is something which, if you did the right experiment and got a specific answer, it might tell you that the theory is definitively rolled out. So that's falsifiability. And there's a slightly naive, but I think you know, more or less correct theory of, of science that says that science is the set of ideas that are falsifiable in that way. So something like um, belief in a higher power, that might not be falsifiable. It might be that no matter what happens in the world, well, that's just the will of this higher power and we don't know why. Uh, so that, that's not science, which is fine. Nothing, not everything has to be science. But, but science is a, is a concrete idea where um, uh, there ought to be certain experiments, which if they turn out in a particular way, they weigh very heavily or completely rule out that scientific theory. And um, it's actually an interesting way to look at it. You have kind of a big, I don't know, cake of ideas, right? Of all the possible ideas in science. And every time you do an experiment, you're ruling out some of them. So you're, you're cutting off slices of that cake. 
And as time passes, you do more and more experiments, and the slice of cake, or the, the cake that remains, gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And eventually, maybe it's small enough that you're, you know you live, one of those ideas must be right, and, uh, and maybe it's a fairly specific set of ideas, and, and, and that's, that's a win, that's success. So in string theory, there are certainly predictions that are falsifiable. Uh, for instance, string theories predict that gravity is described by Einstein's theory of general relativity, at least at the, at the classical level. Yeah. Uh, so before you do experiments that are quantum mechanical in nature, it should be described by that. Um, it predicts that, uh, that the laws of physics are Lorentz invariant locally. So that means, I was mentioning before, that time flows at different rates for objects that are moving fast versus, <coughs> versus slow. And this is uh, something that's very well tested, um, at least in, in certain ways. You can do, you can literally put an atomic clock, a precise clock on an airplane, fly it around the world and compare it to its twin atomic clock that didn't do that. And you'll see that the one that flew around the world ran at a different rate than the one that remained still. Um, the GPS satellite system, it's a, 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 it's a set of satellites. And the way it works is by timing. So your cell phone, it gets signals from a bunch of satellites. It compares the, uh, the timestamp on each signal and it can determine where it is on Earth. That system wouldn't work if it didn't take into account relativistic time dilation and gravitational uh, time delay. So we're, oh, and a, another example actually are uh, particles that decay rapidly when they're at rest. In a particle accelerator where they're moving very, very rapidly, they live for much longer, again, because of this time delay. So we have you know, really strong evidence that the world is, is, that special relativity, the rules of special relativity work in the world we live in. And, but if we were to discover that that wasn't the case, and people are always looking for that, uh, that would that would rule out string theory. String theory is a theory that predicts that this is a feature of the world. So I think it's clearly falsifiable. The criticism is really, I mean, more precisely that it, those ideas already existed prior to string theory. They're not unique to string theory. You can write down a, a, a different theory, a quantum field theory, which has all those features. Well, quantum field theory plus gravity, which has all those features that I just mentioned. So, um, and that, I think that's a legitimate criticism. Where string theory makes predictions that are essentially unique is when you start measuring quantum gravitational effects. And what makes that so difficult is that we didn't even know about quantum mechanics until 100 years ago. That's because quantum effects in, in the macroscopic world tend to be really hard to measure. And gravity, even though this might sound strange, is by far the weakest of the forces of nature that we know of. Um, the classic way to see that is you can take a little tiny magnet and you can lift a paper clip or another piece of metal with that magnet that means the, the magnetic force from that little magnet is stronger than the gravitational force from the entire Earth, which is pulling down on the paperclip that you're lifting, right? So gravity is very weak. You have this giant planet, all of that mass, it's weaker than this, this tiny magnet. So quantum gravity, you're putting together two very small effects. Uh, the weakest force in nature with quantum mechanics that has hard to detect uh, uh, signals. And so it's really difficult to measure anything in quantum gravity, and essentially we've never done it. So, uh, so that's why it's hard, it's hard to, to sort of directly test string theory in its predictions that are the most unique. Um, but that's, I think, again, not unique to string theory. It would be true for any theory of quantum gravity. Um, How is that? Is there a future in which other ideas that are um, exciting in terms of the future of being able to test quantum gravity in particular, the predictions that string theory is made about quantum gravity? Is there a future where we could test those predictions? Um, I hope so. Um, I mean, I've spent some of my career thinking about the early universe because the early universe is a situation where quantum gravity really was important, if you go back far enough. And uh, of course, it's hard to go back. You can't actually go back and look. But things that happened back then, effects that took place in the early universe, those end up being imprinted on, uh, on cosmology today. So we can look at the structure of galaxies in our universe, for instance, and try to learn something about what happened in the early universe and then maybe use that to, to test whether string theory was right. So I think it's quite plausible that some idea along those lines will bear fruit and could be, so you ask, uh, is there something that would make it likely that string theory is correct? I think at the very least, we might detect something which people uh, used string theory to predict and, um, and then we're able to see, for instance, in, in cosmology. And that wouldn't tell us that it's necessarily correct. Maybe there's some other theory that also makes that prediction. But again, you always have this issue in science, that, that piece of cake that remains, it's never just one theory. Yeah. There's always a bunch of ideas in there. 
Um, but if you've sort of cut away a lot of ideas with some experiment and the one that you were trying to test is one of the ones that remains, that may give you more confidence that it's that you're on the right track. So you mentioned you spent much of your career thinking about the Anna universe. Can we kind of go back there for a sec? So I mean, one of the special things talking about the universe before is that it started very, very small, but really no entropy, and then expanded very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, could you speak a little about what we know about this period and what we don't know? Right. So you, I think you're referring to the period called inflation, and uh, that's cosmic inflation rather than financial inflation. Mm -hmm. um, but it has a few of the same features. So you know, one of the most people think of, of financial inflation as a bad thing because it wipes away your savings, right? So you have a bank account and it was worth a lot and then there's a lot of inflation, now it's worth much less, um, which is true. But it's also a good thing if you happen to have a lot of debts. Um, so, you know, governments are happy about that sometimes. If you have a lot of debts in, in that currency and there's a lot of inflation, then all the debts aren't, so you're not in as much debt effectively as you were before. So cosmic inflation, in a way, um, has that feature, which is perhaps one reason why it's called that, um, in the sense that uh, it's a period where the universe expands so rapidly that any uh, variations that were present in the early universe, variations in, in density and temperature and uh, the amount of radiation that was around, or if there had been matter, the amount of matter that was around, those variations just get wiped away. So you could think of a, a region with a high density as, as sort of a large bank account and a region with a low density as a big debt or something. So a lot of cosmic inflation wipes out those differences and, and sets everybody back back to zero. So it produces a universe which is uh, the same everywhere, or almost exactly the same everywhere. And um, one of the reasons we think it happened is that the universe on very large scales is like that. It's almost exactly smooth and homogeneous. It has hardly any variations in, in density once you once you average over uh, large enough distance scales. So. Um, one way to say that is, okay, we live well, in this room. There's very big fluctuations in density. The air is very diffuse. The floor where, where uh, our feet are on is, is very, very dense. So there's huge differences in density between the air and the floor. Um, but if you were to just zoom out until you see the solar system, and then just take the average density in some big ball that contains the solar system, you would get a result which is much smaller than anything we have here on Earth, because most of that volume would be empty space. And if you zoom out again and average over the whole galaxy, you get an even smaller result. Zoom out again and average over a bunch of galaxies, you get again some result. And now when you start comparing those regions to each other, all of them contain roughly the same number of galaxies. And so the differences in average density between those large regions becomes really small. It becomes about one part in 10,000 or 100,000. So that homogeneity, it's called, how homogeneous the universe is on large scales, is very difficult to explain unless you had this theory of cosmic inflation this period of rapid expansion. And so that was the main motivation for, uh, for this theory. But since then, there's been more and more evidence for it, um, which I'm happy to go into if, if you'd like. Uh, yeah, sure, yeah. that would be yeah, interesting to collaborate on. OK, so, so it's, it's not just a theory which uh, smooths everything out and makes it sort of arbitrarily homogeneous. Uh, and that's actually because of quantum mechanics. So in quantum mechanics, you sort of can't have anything be perfect. Um, for instance, you, you can't precisely know the position of a, of a particle. You've probably heard of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that says that uh, the product of the uncertainty of position times the uncertainty of momentum is greater than or equal to h bar over 2, some amount. So if you perfectly knew the position, you'd have to have no knowledge whatsoever of the, of the momentum so that the product of 0 times infinity could be not too small, right? So, um, so or maybe said a little bit better. The, the more precisely you know the position, the less precisely you know the momentum. This is a problem for uh, modern computers. You try to make circuits really tiny and confine electrons to a really short distance. Well, then they have a lot of momentum, and then they can hop out of the circuit entirely and cause an error. And so, um, OK, so, so that's the uncertainty principle. This applies very broadly in any quantum theory. And if you had a universe that was perfectly homogeneous, you would know precisely what the density is. And this actually would lead to a very large uncertainty in, well, something like the rate of change of that density. Uh, so so um, what this means in inflation is that you never get to a state where the universe is perfectly homogeneous. There are always some fluctuations. And, um, and those fluctuations in a theory that might correspond to the world have an amplitude of about one part in 10,000 or one part in 100,000. So one of the things the theory predicts is that the reason why there are any perturbations in density. The reason why we have galaxies and stars at all is because during inflation, quantum mechanics was causing these fluctuations to exist. 
And then once inflation ended, regions that were a little bit over dense by one part in 100,000 or so, uh, gradually got denser and denser. The rich get richer, right? So similarly, an, an over dense region gets more and more over dense. It has gravity that pulls things into it. And, um, and so after billions of years post inflation, uh, the dense regions got so dense that, that stars ignited and galaxies were produced and so on. So it's incredibly, it's a really beautiful idea. This theory of quantum mechanics that was first uh, used to describe atomic physics is, we believe, the origin of, uh, of galaxies. It's the origin of why there's gravitational structure at all, why there are planets, why we're here. Um, and when you look at the night sky, you're looking at quantum fluctuations in this very early, early phase of the universe that have now been imprinted as, as stars and uh, constellations. So um, yeah, so to me, that's one of the most beautiful ideas in physics because it connects this theory of, that we think of as being you know, a theory of very small things and very subtle effects and very hard to measure with the most obvious thing in the world that you go out at night and you wonder where the stars came from. So, so what, what you, you, you mentioned, I mean, alluded to that, that period ended at some point and then kind of period is very, very brief beginning of the universe. What, why is the period so brief? Why did inflation suddenly stop to, to the best of our knowledge? Well, I guess what we know for sure is that um, the part of it that we can observe was very brief. So uh, we, we know the time scale on which the universe doubled in volume during inflation. Um, or to be more precise, we, we know that it had to have been a, a tiny fraction of a second. It could have been an even tinier fraction of a second, but there's kind of a, an upper bound on how long it could have taken. So, um, so we know that it, it really took a, a very, very uh, brief period of time. Um, but we don't know, so that's the, t the time for the universe to double in volume. And we know that the universe increased in volume by an enormous factor. It doubled um, 70 or 80 times at least in, in, uh, in linear size <coughs> uh, d during, during, this, during this phase. So, so each time it's multiplied by two, right? So it grew to this from a tiny size to an enormous size. So we know that much, but we don't know how much further back in time that went on. So it actually could have lasted for a pretty long time, probably still a tiny fraction of a second, but you know, longer than the part that, that affects, the, uh, affects what we can measure. And the reason for this uncertainty is related to what, where we started, that there's an observable universe with a horizon, so we only see a, a finite part. And so if you imagine this sort of like little balloon, that's the universe before inflation, the whole thing blows up. Now draw a circle on the surface of that balloon, that's the observable universe today. And so we don't really know how big the balloon is, right? We're just seeing this part inside the circle. The balloon could be much, much, much bigger than what we're seeing, or it might only be, say, 10 times bigger. So what, I mean, we started, uh, the universe was extremely, extremely dense beforehand and, and the entropy. Does string theory do anything to explain how that got there in the first place? No, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a really interesting and fundamental question. Um, goes back to the invention of the theory that, that describes entropy, which is thermodynamics or statistical mechanics. Um, I don't think we have anything definitive to say about why the, the entropy of the early universe was low. And um, you know, just to expand on that a little bit, <laughs> entropy increases because low entropy corresponds to states that are highly unusual in some way. So um, you know, I've got a couple of kids, and if there's a, a drawer with socks in it that's organized and, and, and they get in there, it's not organized after a while. Um, it increases the entropy, right. Yeah. Um, and, and that's a generic fact about the world. In fact, what they're doing is, is just what life is. Life is a process that increases entropy. Um, all the interesting things in the world are starting from low entropy and, and, and increasing the entropy. Um, so for that to be possible, the entropy had to be low just globally overall uh, to begin with. And, and yet that, that's in some sense an unusual, unlikely state to be in. Um, because, well, the reason entropy tends to always increase is just that there are a lot more possibilities, a lot more states with higher entropy than lower entropy. So it's uh, exceedingly unlikely that entropy would, would decrease just because if you randomly wander around in the space of possibilities, almost all of them have higher entropy than whenever, wherever it is that you started. Okay, so, that, so that's the, the basic puzzle of it. And that's true in string theory, just as it is in any other theory. Right. Um, and we don't have a, it's, it's an absolutely fascinating question. We don't have a good answer. Right? We have some ideas. Uh, what, are, what are some of the ideas, may I ask? <clears throat> well, um, one of my favorites, but I've never been able to make this actually work. So uh, perhaps it's wrong, probably it's wrong. But one of my favorite ideas is that 
the increase in entropy is in some sense, I wouldn't say it's an illusion, but it's um, specific to the way we define entropy and the way we measure disorder. In other words, um, this mess of socks all mixed up to us looks like a high entropy state because we want socks of the same color to be paired with each other. But maybe someone else would look at that and say, oh, this is actually exactly how I wanted them to be arranged. You know, what a coincidence that they ended up that way. Um, if you pour water into a, into a uh, you know, crevice in the street and it fills it, the shape of the water is precisely the same as the shape of that crevice. That's not a coincidence. But the water might say, isn't it a miracle that I have exactly the shape of this crevice? Right. So maybe uh, we evolved or we exist in a way that makes it look to us as though uh, the entropy in the universe is, is low or was low in the past and is increasing. But no matter what the state was, maybe that could still be true. Maybe there's a way of uh, uh, some sort of life existing no matter what the state is. And that life will always interpret the entropy as being low. So this is an idea that uh, it makes sense in a certain mathematical way, but I don't know how to establish it. I've tried, and uh, right. it doesn't seem to so, Okay, that's one idea. Um, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, are there any other good ones? I mean, the, the, or is that even a good one? The, the, there are, um, well, okay, so, so one idea which definitely doesn't work um, that I actually also used to think about was that uh, entropy is low by coincidence. That so every now and then disorder does decrease spontaneously, even though it's very unlikely. Um, so it's actually a fact that if you take the universe as it is and, and you wait infinitely long, or let's say a very, very not infinite, but an extremely long time, it will return to a state with very low entropy. It will return to a state that's arbitrarily close to the one we're in now, or the one even earlier in the universe when the entropy was even lower. Those are called Poincare recurrences. And under a few circumstances or conditions that we think are probably satisfied, that's guaranteed to happen if you wait long enough. So that almost sounds like it's an answer. I mean, this, conditions like the ones in the early universe are guaranteed to happen. They're not just possible, they're actually certain to occur. The difficulty though is that for every one time that that happens, there's an enormous number of other times where something slightly different happens, where the entropy wasn't quite as low as what you wanted it to be. For instance, the state of the universe today has higher entropy than the early universe. If you trust this Poincaré recurrence idea, um, there are many more periods of time where the universe looks like it does today than like it looks like it had even lower entropy in the past. Right. Bottom line, it's, this theory doesn't, doesn't really explain anything because it tells us that um, the universe should, should not really have a past. There shouldn't have been lower entropy in the past. It should just be as it is now. So this is a, a line of reasoning. It's sometimes referred to as Boltzmann, Boltzmann's brain because Ludwig Boltzmann, who sort of discovered statistical mechanics, thought along these lines and got really confused and worried about it. Um, and uh, so I, I think, yeah, bottom line is that, is that that doesn't work either. It can't be just a coincidence that we see entropy being low. There needs to be another explanation. Um, so, yeah. Other ideas involve changing the fundamental laws of physics in a way that's more profound than what string theory does. Right, okay. Yeah, changing it so there's really a preferred direction of time. Yeah. Um, and the entropy increases because that's built into the laws of physics. So that's, that's a possibility too. There's no evidence for it other than this question. Um, uh, and it would mean abandoning a lot of principles that seem to work pretty well. But that's another Well, idea. on the theme of seemingly unlikely occurrences, you need comes to paper. Um, I believe it was um, at the accidental universe, which, was, um, which is a, a great name, by the way. Like, um, um, could you could you briefly explain um, what what that paper what that paper said? Yeah, so that was accidental with an X um, yes, because uh, right. That, so we were writing about um, particles that are called axions, and uh, those are I would say the best motivated particles, motivated in the sense that we have the, the biggest reason to think that they might exist. You know, sort of of the set of ideas of, of, of things that have not yet been observed, right? So, um, so axions are, are particles that they have a, a lot of reasons to be, uh, theoretically, but, but we haven't seen them. So we don't know if they exist. Um, in, in string theory, they certainly exist. There are always axions. And uh, in some sense, typically, there are hundreds of different types of axions. And they have a really interesting set of features. For one thing, they can be everywhere from uh, very, very massive, meaning it takes quite a lot of energy to produce even one of them, to so light that they are effectively without any, any mass at all. Um, so you have this huge range of masses. 
<coughs> and you have this relatively large number of them, hundreds of them. And what we noticed in that paper is that if you randomly choose, so, so we, we're not uh, mathematically strong enough to compute from string theory the properties of these particles in, in a very precise way. So we don't know even what string theory would predict in many, there are many things that we can't, we can't use string theory to predict about them. And so we said, okay, let's just randomly choose the, uh, the parameters that describe these hundreds of axion particles. And then let's ask what would a universe look like that, if that were the right, the right theory. And what we discovered is that within a pretty large class of, of random, of ways of choosing these parameters randomly, um, if you just ask, if you just look at the parts of the universe that contain anything like stars or galaxies. So that means universes where, um, uh, where the universe lived long enough for gravity to form um, dense structures. Uh, some universes don't live very long. They expand and then recollapse. Um, and universes that didn't undergo such a violent kind of inflation that you would never produce any kind of bound structures because they would just get torn apart by this expansion. So if you just focus your attention on regions that, are, that have the property that there are gravitationally bound structures like stars or galaxies in them, um, that someone living in, in, in that part of the universe would see cosmologies that look a lot like ours. They would have this period of inflation early on and then the universe would keep expanding. It would be, we didn't talk about this yet, but it would be dominated first by radiation and then by matter and then eventually by dark energy. And um, that's, that's precisely what we see on, on just that very broad way. Like so we see a universe that underwent inflation, then radiation domination, matter domination, and then around now, uh, dark energy domination. So this, you know, this randomly chosen theory with just this constraint that there should be something that you could possibly live on, some kind of gravitationally bound structure, um, in broad brush looks a lot like what we observe. Right. Uh, which I thought was really interesting. And it's, an, it's kind of like an accident. Um, yeah. So that was the, there's a, there's a book called The Accidental Universe with, with a C uh, by Paul Davies. That, that was the inspiration for the title. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So kind of storyboarding the, the universe slightly, the story of the universe kind of start, starts it from the beginning and a bit of a mystery as to why there's about entropy but don't have this inflationary period. Mm -hmm. um, and then, I mean, you mentioned mostly radiation and then matter. What's, what's the rest of the story of the universe? So you briefly mentioned there, um, can come, you said dark matter will take up more of the universe. Dark matter and dark um, energy. Dark yeah. matter and dark energy. Mm -hmm. so, so that's increasingly going to be the case. And why exactly is that from, from what we know? Yeah, so that's been one of the most interesting discoveries of the last 20 years. Um, actually, almost 25 now. Uh, so, so the very first big physics talk I ever went to was in 1998. Um, I was starting my PhD, and it was the discovery of uh, the acceleration of the expansion of the universe. And um, that was uh, it was a colloquium by uh, Saul Perlmutter. Um, so what they noticed was by observing a certain type of supernovae, type 1a supernovae, uh, they could measure how rapidly the universe was expanding. So we've mentioned that a few times. What it means to say the universe is expanding is that, <clears throat> well, it's like a balloon and being blown up. If you're living on the surface of the balloon and there's some pattern of galaxies printed on the surface of the balloon, as it expands, those, those galaxies move apart from each other. And if you're living in one galaxy, you'll see all the other nearby galaxies moving away, even though there's nothing special about that point of the balloon. The same would be true at any other point. So that's a two-dimensional version of this three-dimensional universe that we live in, um, where we look around and, and we see everything moving away from us. And what was expected back then was that if you were to measure the rate at which the universe is expanding, you would see it slowing down as time passed because gravity is attractive. Gravity pulls things together. So if you have a bunch of galaxies and they're moving apart from each other, well, they're, they're attracting each other. So that speed should slow down. Just like if you throw a rock up in the air, it might be moving away from the earth, but it will slow down. Unless you threw it at seven miles per second or faster, it will fall back down and hit you on the head. Uh, but even if you threw it faster than escape velocity, it will still slow down as it, as it escapes from the Earth's gravity. So it was expected that the expansion would be slowing down. But by measuring these type 1a supernovae, um, and I could explain why that was important, that particular type of supernova, but what, by measuring those, you could determine this rate. And what they found to their surprise was that it was increasing with time. So everything was expanding, and that rate of expansion was going faster and faster, as if gravity was repulsive instead of attractive. And this was a huge shock, really very surprising. Um, so how to explain it? Turns out Einstein already put in the right ingredient, or, the, or a uh, ingredient that suffice to explain it into his 
theory of gravity when he first discovered it, um, because he noticed that you could, there was a parameter in his theory that wasn't determined by anything. Um, and uh, he called that the cosmological constant. Today we think of it as a vacuum energy, uh, but it's mathematically the same thing. And if the value of that constant, if it has the right sign, if it's positive in the usual convention, then it correspond, or the effect of it will be to make the expansion of the universe accelerate with time. And that's what we call dark energy. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, so dark energy, um, why, and, that, and is dark energy increasing as the universe is becoming bigger? That's just associated with a certain volume of space. Is that what? Yeah, that's one way, right. So the total, you can, you can think of this as an energy per volume. Okay. Um, it's, it's an energy density. And the characteristic of dark energy, if it's a pure cosmological constant, yeah. is that the energy density doesn't change with time at all. So the bigger the universe gets, the more total energy there is because the volume is larger. And that's why the amount of dark energy is very Right. Right. Equivalently, you could say that in a given volume, in a fixed volume, the amount of dark energy is staying the same, but the amount of energy in other things, radiation, matter, is decreasing because the universe is still expanding. So, so if you have some, um, you can think of a bunch of particles and they're, and they're flying apart from each other. So after a while, the number that remain in that volume is fewer because some of them have left it, but right. the amount of vacuum energy is the same. So the longer you wait, the more you're dominated by, by vacuum energy. Uh, and that um, eventually makes the expansion of the universe exponential. In fact, it's, it's very similar to the inflation we were talking about before, but it happens, it's happening, starting to happen now. And if, if dark energy is really vacuum energy, then as time passes, the universe will expand more and more like a pure exponential. It will double in size every fixed amount of time which is like 10 billion years. It's a pretty long time. <laughs> yeah, we've got a while, but still. Yeah. You, you um, sorry, back in the, yeah, um, you um, code a paper called The Disturbing Implications of the Cosmological Constant. Is that the, the name? What's what's disturbing about this then? Is that it's, it's flying apart, or is there something else that's disturbing about its nature? Well, that was the paper where we, where we realized that um, it, it ties back to this question of Poincaré recurrences and Boltzmann brains. So this was not written not, not that long after the discovery of, of the acceleration of the expansion of the universe, which we interpreted as indicating that there is a, a cosmological constant or a, a truly constant vacuum energy. Um, and we, we noticed that if that's the case, then once the universe enters this, this phase of accelerated expansion and, and becomes essentially exponential, there's an event horizon, um, which is very much like the cosmological horizon we talked about before which surrounds any observer. So just pick a point, think of someone standing there looking around and, and there's a, a certain uh, distance away beyond which they will be able to see nothing. So if you have a, a laser pointer and you're, and you're pointing it at me, I can see it as you fall away from me until you reach this event horizon. Actually, it would get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. Once you've crossed the event horizon, not even light from your laser pointer can reach me. And that's because the, the universe is expanding so rapidly, in a sense, it's expanding faster than the speed of light past that horizon. A lot of people say, oh, nothing can go faster than light. Well, no object in sort of ordinary flat space time can go faster than light, but this is the expansion of the universe itself. Uh, and uh, so in any case, there's this event horizon. Uh, there's a long story about event horizons that goes back to the story of black holes and Stephen Hawking and the information paradox. But one way to think about them is that they are absolutely impermeable, which is a very strange thing to say. You would think a horizon is the opposite. You throw anything into it and it's gone. But it um, seems that another way to think about it is that it's actually um, a, a wall that can't be crossed. And anything you throw into it just kind of dissolves onto that wall. And um, the state, if you wait long enough in, in a universe like this, the one we're describing, is that there's absolutely nothing in any volume because everything has fallen onto the horizon. And the horizon is just um, at its biggest possible size. And the entropy associated with that is the maximum possible value. So this is like the thermal equilibrium of this universe. Uh, and when I say there's nothing in the volume, that's not quite right. We talked about these quantum fluctuations. There's always quantum fluctuations. So actually, there's always something in the volume, but it's just tiny fluctuations around this equilibrium state. So uh, according to these laws of statistical mechanics that we mentioned before, if you wait a very, very long time, even though it's exceedingly unlikely, eventually anything that could have existed will come back into existence. So in particular, if you had some galaxies or something, stars, planets, inside this volume, and then a lot of time passed, they fell into the horizon, there was nothing left, 
eventually a state like that one will come back. And so uh, we thought, wow, maybe this explains why the early universe had low entropy, because there are these recurrences. You wait long enough and that state is actually going to happen again. But it doesn't work. It turns out that vastly more likely than a sensible universe, which has a reasonable looking past history, is a universe in which no logic really applies. So for instance, if you were to observe a part of the sky that you had never looked at before through a telescope and you didn't know what was there, and if this were the right theory, you would see no stars or galaxies there because it's easier to produce by this random process, a universe that contains less stuff in it, even though that doesn't have any kind of sensible cosmological history. And so, yeah, this was sort of a disturbing realization. And, and what we were left with was back to no idea about how the early universe had low entropy. Um, this, by the way, got at some point picked up by um, uh, people interested in creationism. Um, yes, they said this is a proof of the existence of God, uh, which, which, of course, it's really... The, the fine-tuning argument. Yeah, basically, right. Yeah, that, that only a God could have created this low entropy initial state. Yeah, well, what, what, are, you, what are your views on that? Is there, is there another solution in your mind as to what could have created this, this initial state that seems quite unlikely? I know it goes back to the entry yeah. and responses, but right. I, I don't have in a... your mind is that just is that we can't say either way? Yeah, I, I think yeah. there are many things in science that we can't answer. Yeah. And maybe there are fewer of those things than there used to be. Right. But I think the, the progress of science and then philosophy and then religion has been always, you know, go far enough back and, and everything was explained by religion because we didn't understand anything. Yeah. And then you know, the longer we wait, the more, uh, the more we understood. And so the sort of purview of religion shrank. Um, and uh, actually, it's true of philosophy as well. And, and the purview of science grew larger. I don't Zeus know. Zeus didn't summer lightning anymore, basically. Say again? Zeus didn't summer lightning anymore, basically. Yeah. I dare. So I don't know. We, we don't have the answer to this question. Um, that doesn't mean there isn't one. We don't, there might be a scientific answer to it. Right. But we don't know what it is at this point. Okay. Yeah. So. so. Well, you touched on event horizons and um, the information within any event horizon or falls onto any event horizon or sort of being stuck within that event horizon. So what, to, to linger on that for a second, so if you look at a black hole mm -hmm. and you throw something in, into a black hole, so the entire information of that object is sort of included on the horizon is what, is yeah. what you're saying. So you can completely describe everything within the black hole from... From the outside. From the outside. That's amazing. That that fact. Yeah, well that's that's what we think is true. In fact, I would say we well, maybe no it's true is a little bit too strong, but there's a version, there's a type of black hole uh, that we have a very precise mathematical description of right. where I think that's probably the best way to to describe what we know about it. That, that yes, indeed, you really just can ignore what's inside. Now, of course, you might be very interested to know what's inside, yes. and maybe, maybe you can. Well, maybe you can also learn about it. Maybe there's a way to extract that information as well. But right. but there seems to be a perfectly consistent description that ignores the inside and really just describes the outside of the event horizon. Yeah. Well, well in in understanding the inside, um, you were speaking before about sort of quantum gravity and how string theory predicts and does quantum gravity. Does string theory predict anything about the nature of black hole or the quantum nature of a black hole? Yeah, so that's actually been one of the more interesting developments in string theory is that it's what I was referring to just now. We have a, a version of quantum gravity and black holes that we understand well in the sense that there's a, a, another theory um, that is perfectly equivalent to the theory of, of quantum gravity, including these black holes. But this other theory is, is much easier to understand. It's not a string theory. It's actually not gravitational. But there's a, it's, I'd say a conjecture, but with very strong evidence that says that this other theory, much easier to understand, is not just similar to, but it's exactly equivalent to quantum gravity in this particular context. So this is called the ADS, which stands for anti de Sitter CFT, which stands for conformal field theory correspondence. So the conformal field theory is a theory that's relatively easy to understand. anti de Sitter is a uh, type of space-time in which you can consider string theory or quantum gravity. And what we believe is true is that that theory with quantum gravity and anti de Sitter spacetime is exactly the same thing as this conformal field theory. So since the conformal field theory is, relatively speaking, easy to understand, then somehow black holes shouldn't be that hard to understand because they're equivalent to something in the conformal field theory. Now, as it turns out, it's a little hard to figure out 
it's, it's hard to answer specific detailed questions, some of them at least, using this correspondence because it's, it's hard to use. Uh, but, but it does tell you that, for instance, information is not destroyed when it falls into a black hole because information is not destroyed in the conformal field theory. And that, that we know for sure. So um, there's a famous information paradox that Stephen Hawking formulated. <clears throat> and uh, for years, he maintained that information must be destroyed by black holes. Eventually, he reversed himself. Um, but uh, at, least for, at least if his correspondence is correct and for black holes in anti-sitter space-time, we know information is not, is not destroyed. Right. So, okay, so, so going, going back to the storyboard of the universe, we have this beginning, this middle, um, where uh, increasing the amount of dark energy and dark matter in the universe, um, black holes popping up into the far future, or then, I mean, the, uh, probably being ripped apart to some extent, or at least we're, we're expanding at an exponentially increasing rate with increasing dark energy, potentially, as you're mentioning. Yeah. Is that a sort of, correct me if I'm, yeah. I'm wrong in reviewing the sort of, uh, more, more or less, yeah, one detail, dark matter doesn't, doesn't increase. Dark, dark matter, we think, is just like ordinary matter, except it doesn't interact with light. That's what makes it dark. So it doesn't produce light, and it doesn't absorb or reflect light. So um, it's, it's just a type of matter that's really hard to see, but otherwise it's not so different from the, the matter that we're made out of. Um, and then the other thing I would say is that the, the rate of exponential expansion, how to put it, the, the time it takes for the universe to double in size, that time remains the same no matter how long you wait. So, so that rate doesn't increase. Um, and, and that actually means that things won't get ripped apart. They'll just fall into the horizon. Like they'll get more and more diffuse as the universe gets bigger and bigger. So as the things fall into the horizon, I know this might be a bit hysteric, but is there any way for, for us to, in, the, in billions of years time, is there any conceivable way that we could leave that horizon ourselves, or is that just so low with what we understand today, not what we can see before? Well, the, the funny thing is there's a horizon around every point in the space. So it's like the island. You can imagine, let's say instead of an island, a ship, you climb to the top of the mast, and then you can see maybe, I don't know, 20 miles or something. Um, uh, that might be too far. You, you can see a few miles uh, from the mast of the ship. And so that's the horizon for the ship. Um, you could have two of these ships. Each one has its own horizon, and they could exit each other's horizons. Nothing unusual would happen. So, um, so now that might sound a bit contradictory because I'm saying when something, the horizon is impermeable and nothing can leave it. So it, it must be the case, and, and this we actually don't understand very well, but it must be the case that in a theory that describes this space time with, with the horizon around every point, that there are a whole bunch of similar descriptions, each one of which is itself a, a perfectly good complete description, and each one of which describes one horizon volume. So you ask, can we fall into the horizon? Well, we can always fall in, we're always falling into the horizon of, of somebody who's just falling into our own horizon, right? Um, so yeah, and yet nothing happens to us. So there's gotta be two descriptions, one where we're being kind of melted and smeared out on this horizon, and another one where nothing happens to us at all, and it's the other person that's being melted and smeared out. And so it's really an interesting and challenging question how this could possibly work, um, and we don't actually have a good theory of it, um, but I think there probably is one that, that describes this. Okay, so this is kind of slightly over. So to to our sort of a final question, I mean, um, the work that you deal with for this these um, unfathomably large scales. Um, was there is there a particular moment where you have looked at something and it it really struck you, and you you've just been in awe of of what of what you're researching and what you're, what you're looking up at? I think maybe when I first started thinking about the possibility of there being a multiverse right. and realized that we might in our lifetime observe the effects of collisions, we didn't really touch on this, but collisions between, between different bubbles, that we could actually make a, a measurement that would prove is too strong of a word for the reasons we said before, but that would provide very strong evidence for the existence of other universes, or at least other bubbles um, within this multiverse. And, um, you know, that may never happen. It may never happen because it's not true. In fact, maybe there aren't, there isn't this multiverse, there aren't these bubbles. Or it may never happen because we just aren't able to detect it or it hasn't happened yet. Uh, so it's, you know, one of the strange things about science is that you may never know if your ideas are correct. But the fact that we could, it's possible that we could make that measurement, 
I just think is uh, enormously exciting. It would, it would be a, a new Copernican revolution. It would change our whole view on, on everything. So, um, in, so how, to, to weigh that down slightly, we said and we, there, are, there are these collisions. You, how can we go about detecting that? How, how does that even work? Right, so, so in theories that have, um, so we, we, at some point we were talking about the different configurations of the extra dimensions, how extra dimensions could have different shapes and sizes. That's one version of, of this sort of theory, but there's other ones that are somewhat simpler. Really any theory that has uh, more than one local minimum of the energy uh, can have, so it can have a stable, it can have more than one stable configuration. And um, when I say the energy, I'm not, I'm not talking about a piece of chalk on the, on the holder over there, I'm talking about the entire region of the universe we're living in. So um, if there's more than one possibility for, uh, for, for example, the vacuum energy, it could take a different value in this region of the universe than it does in a, in a separate region. If you have a theory like that, and theories like that are actually pretty common, then there can be, well, different regions of the universe in which the vacuum energy, among other quantities, takes different values. Um, not only can there be different regions, there can be transitions from one to the other. So uh, we're familiar with um, a glass of beer or a glass of champagne, which has uh, carbon dioxide dissolved in it, and every now and then a bubble appears, and then it rises to the surface. But <clears throat> if you didn't have gravity, this bubble would just appear. Um, and so there's been a spontaneous phase change where liquid turned into gas, at least in, the, in that region. Um, that kind of phase transition can occur in the universe as a whole. So, so if you have a, a region that has, let's say, high vacuum energy, a bubble of lower vacuum energy can spontaneously appear through quantum mechanics. And in that case, instead of just sitting there or rising to the surface, it will expand. It has lower energy, so there's a, a force on the walls of the bubble that makes it want to grow, so it will start to increase in size. Um, so these are cosmic bubbles. And so in a, th a theory like the one I'm describing, where there's more than one possible uh, phase, um, you'll have eventually, if you wait long enough, lots of bubbles that appear spontaneously. And they might run into each other. They expand forever, but they don't necessarily collide with each other because the whole universe is expanding as well. And there's this event horizon we discussed. So if they're far enough apart, they can't contact each other. But if they appear close enough together, then because they're expanding, they'll run into each other. And so if we are living inside one of those bubbles, um, we might not know. The bubble would have to be larger than our observable universe. So our observable universe is, think of the circle on the surface of the balloon. We can't see beyond that, really. Uh, if the bubble we live in is a bit bigger than that, we, it would actually look very much like what we see. But if in the past another bubble ran into that, ran into ours, it sends a pulse of energy that we call a cosmic wake, like the wake of a boat, which uh, ripples across the, the universe. And if it enters our observable universe, then we will see its effect. Um, does that relate to patterns you were talking about before in the inflationary period? Or? Right. So, so normally in, in inflation, the perturbations are random and right. they're kind of local, like they happen in one place, but they don't affect uh, other regions. Uh, this sort of a pattern, well, I guess you could compare it to, to random ripples on, on the ocean just coming from wind or something uh, versus the, the wake of a boat, which is this long, you know, clear sort of wave. Uh, so these, the effects of these collisions make patterns on what's called the cosmic microwave background or on the structure of galaxies, which are like that. They have coherent features over very large scales and a particular symmetry, a particular pattern. So if we were to observe something like this, and people have looked, and there's no good evidence for it, uh, but perhaps in the future, if we were to observe something like this... What extra data would we need to <laughs> observe something like that? What are we missing at the moment? Um, well, we've looked at the cosmic microwave background, which is um, a spectrum of micro very ancient microwave light that came from the early universe. We've looked at that in, in pretty extraordinary detail by now. Um, there's still things to measure about it, but it's not very likely that we're going to see a signal of this there, which is, that was probably our best chance, at least that we know of now. But we haven't looked in such detail at the structure of matter, of how galaxies are arranged. Or there might be future observables like the cosmic neutrino background, for yeah. instance, um, which is similar to the cosmic microwave background, but particles of neutrino, that are called neutrinos rather than photons, which are microwaves. So there, there could be future cosmological observables or closer analysis of ones that we've already seen, which, which could reveal this. Or there might be something that just people haven't thought of yet, some other signal of this collision besides the ones we've looked for so far. And um, what question should we be concerned that another 
bubble could smash into us, is that something to worry about or are we completely safe? <laughs> We're not completely safe, but we shouldn't be concerned. Uh, and uh, the, the reason is that, um, well, if, so when these bubbles collide, there's sort of two possibilities. One is that our bubble will push its way into the other one. Okay. Inversely, the other bubble could push its way into ours. Which of these happens depends on the characteristics of these two bubbles. Right. Um, but the bubble that's pushing into the other one, that piece of its wall, of its edge, um, expands at essentially the speed of light in, into the other bubble. Uh, if it wasn't initially at the speed of light, it accelerates in a very short period of time until it's almost at the speed of light. So it's, it's moving basically at the speed of light. Right. And what that means is you don't have any news of it because nothing can move faster oh, so we than light. Be worried, we should be dead We'd be instantly annihilated, right? It's, right? it's a giant windshield and we're a bug and the windshield is going <laughs> hundreds of miles an hour. So it's just, so, you know, by the time it hits your toes or, or let's say if it hits your toes, yeah. a nerve impulse wouldn't reach your brain by the time the bubble wall has it much slower. So you have nothing to worry about in that sense. Uh, and the fact that we're still here after the universe is 14 billion years old, this hasn't happened yet, the chances that it would happen so even if you don't find that comforting, the chances that it would happen in the next, say, million years are minuscule, right? Because it hasn't happened in 14 billion. So what are the chances it happens in right. a million, which is a thousandth of a billion? Um, so, so I think we don't have a lot to worry about um, uh, in terms of, of, of being That's annihilated. That's somewhat reassuring. Yeah. It's equally terrifying. Right. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, so just to finish off the conversation, do you have any piece of advice for people who are looking to potentially go into this line of research in the future? I mean, I, I think, so we live in a world where things are changing very, very quickly. We have artificial intelligence, we have all sorts of societal changes. And I think that young people should ask themselves, what, 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 do, they, what do they really care about? What, what, do they want, what do they want to leave behind? Or what do they want to spend their lives doing? What would really have meaning? And of course, Many people, I mean, everybody has a different answer to that question, but I think we should all be asking ourselves, what is our answer? And for me, the answer was um, to discover something truly new, something that no one knew before to add to our understanding and knowledge. And again, that might not be the answer for everyone, but, but I think it's fundamentally a good thing to be doing. Um, and if that's your answer, then um, there's a whole world of questions to investigate. We know so little actually. We've made such a tiny dent in, uh, in understanding the, the universe around us. That's not just true of physics, it's, it's true of other sciences as well. But I think physics is particularly stark because we ask some of the most fundamental questions. Why is there a universe at all? What's the fate of the universe? What's the substructure of matter? These kind of questions, just what's the basics of the world that we live in? What's it made out of? Where is it going? Where did it come from? I think these are, these are fascinating questions, I think. AI doesn't have a prayer of answering any of them. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but at least for now, AI is just a sort of amalgam of the existing human knowledge. It's not creating new knowledge. So I think to, to answer, to make progress on questions like that, let alone to answer them, there's a certain creativity, right? People think of scientists not, not as being creative, but as being, I don't know, calculators or something. But actually the essence of, of science, the, the, the real core of it is, is creativity. You have to come up with a new idea before you can test your new idea, you have to come up with it. So we need people thinking about these things. And, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a really valuable thing to do. It's very satisfying. It feels to me like a truly worthwhile thing to be doing. And so I, I love it. I, I would recommend it to anyone. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you once again for listening. I'd love to carry on that conversation in the future. The scale and implications of what we discussed were mind boggling. Now I could really do with your help. The more likes and subscribers I get, the more amazing people I'll be able to talk to in the future. In the meantime, to learn more about this incredible world we live in, check out these previous interviews. Mm -hmm.